Hello everyone, this is Inti Nasr, a PhD student at the University of Freiburg Galaxy team. And today I will be guiding you through one of the Galaxy Training Network material for pathogen detection using food samples. So to reach the training, you have two ways, either through the Galaxy Training Materials or the Galaxy Training Network website here, or through your user account on the Galaxy one of any or any of the galaxy servers so you can find it here under the training galaxy training material hat and then you can navigate to microbiome and then you can find our training under the name pathogen detection from direct nanopore sequencing data using galaxy footbond edition so i can also reach the same thing here microbiome then after scrolling down I can find it here so before we start let me first give you a quick introduction about the idea of the training material that we'll be going through today and before that I would like to recommend you that you take our previous league galaxy or you must have already passed through that <laughs> if not please go through the introductory course uh, or the introductory material named Introduction to the Galaxy Analysis. You will find it in the training material here. Just make sure that you have your account already on Galaxy. You know the platform a bit, so where to find the tools, where does the tools run in your history. So some basic uh, or introductory things to go through Galaxy. However, if you did not or did not find the time to take the introductory material for Galaxy, we will be doing the training today step by step. So yeah, you can also manage doing it together. So the idea behind the pathogen detection training was actually based on one of the projects that I've been working on to create workflows in the Galaxy platforms to identify all possible, possible pathogens that can be found in any samples, does not have to be a food sample. And why we do this? Because um, during any food outbreak or any, um, like any contamination that takes place, we want a prompt response and we want a, a quick and fast actions to be done. And to do that, we need to identify all possible pathogens that can be present in any in any samples quickly and track the presence and stop it directly. Why in the beginning? Because actually the food contamination is one of the biggest health issues that our societies are facing, affecting around 600 million people yearly. And unfortunately, it causes some death. And if we look to them, um, what are the methods that are can be taken during this or such a foodborne outbreak is, for example, some traditional methods like P PCR and whole genome sequencing. So this requires, or both of them, either require a prior knowledge of the pathogen, so you have to know what you are looking for, which we don't need in, in an outbreak, or you are targeting a specific uh, part of the DNA so you need a prior knowledge and you don't you will not know everything about the what is there in your dna or the sequence of the sample so what you need now in order to identify agnostically what is there in this in all of the samples that you have and what how they they interact together and whether or not they are for example all the kind of microbial communities and whether or not they are harmful um, bacteria, they are pathogens or not, just they affect each other, where to find it, in which sample, and so on, you need shotgun metagenomic sequencing, where you identify basically everything and you study the interactions between what you have found. So what is there and what are they doing? Combined with some techniques like nanopore sequencing, you are ensuring a very fast, a real-time sequencing and an accurate also um, identification of the of the of the pathogen itself. So it's it's needed in some prompt responses in in foodborne outbreaks, for example. So here is the story behind why it's important <laughs> to to identify quickly and agnostically what is there in the sample, 
and comes now the idea of the workflows that we will be using together in this training today and the analysis that we will be doing is that we we want everyone can identify or know what is there in the sample without being a computer scientist in the first place so that's why we will see the creative workflows together or the tools that we can use to create these workflows so that we can afterwards share these workflows to anyone just by clicking on running the workflows as you have already seen maybe in previous training and you will be see, seeing today together with me with the running the workflows they can directly identify using some cool figures where are the pathogens how to find them how to track them and how to stop their presence so today we will be seeing um, five main workflows starting from pre-processing until the visualizations of the pathogens and and the heat maps to track their presence along all the samples and so on so the training have basically two versions either a short version or a long version where you can choose from here. So choose your own training or choose your own tutorial. We will be seeing today the short version because I want you to try the workflows and uh, see how cool they run. And we leave them and they, they run automatically. And then maybe after we finish this training, I recommend you to have a look on the long version we'll be, where we'll be going through a tool by tool and running one tool after another, not a workflow as a whole. Using also the short version, I will be going through one workflow at a time. And then we, we can also talk about the tools that have been used in each one of these workflows. So you can also know what are the used tools and how to check the outputs to, of these work, tools one at, at a time. So let's start by in, uh, creating a new history in Galaxy. So we need an empty, totally empty history. So either if you already have logged into Galaxy, you just need to, and you already have another history here, you just click on the plus sign and then you'll have a completely em empty history. And afterwards, just rename it whatever you want. So pathogen detection, oh, detection GTN just any name that you can remark maybe here in the annotation you can write today's day so i will just leave it here 2024 but for you you can put the full day and in galaxy you can also have cool tags that you can check afterwards or have in common with other um, existing histories and you can share and you can search using these uh, tags afterwards so a hashtag can promote your tag so can be can be promoted along. Um, you'll see what I mean by promotion promoting tags afterwards. But I will use also. You can choose whatever you want to do. You can put here, for example, pre-processing, like here, and then because we will be starting with pre-processing, and then you click save. That's actually you can find here in the beginning. Of the training that you create a new history you can also find some cool steps here where exactly you can create it and then some renaming of your history and we added one more where we tagged our history together so that would be our first step then as i told you before that our samples today will be food samples and we will be using two, only two samples in this training so that our workflows will run fast together. So in order to import some data sets, you just need to copy from here. And then here also you have some uh, information how to import your data sets, but we can do it together. So you get back to your Galaxy training, uh, sorry, your, your history. And then you click on upload. And since we have links, so you need to use here fetch and paste your data. If your files was already, if you want to do the same training on your own sample, then and you have it on a on a saved hard drive, for example, you can choose it from here, 
or if you have it remotely, you can choose from here. So you have multiple ways in order to do that. For us now, we would just be pasting what we have copied from the Galaxy Training Network of our two samples. So in this training, we have two different samples. Both of them have, now we will know because these are test samples, but supposedly we should not know what is there. So, but for, for you, I will tell you now that these are chicken samples that are spiked with some salmonella um, pathogen, but each one of them is a different strain of salmonella. So, so each one of them has a, the same species, but different subspecies or the different strain of salmonella. So let's press together here, start, and then all your samples will be uploaded to your history. While it's loading, we can get back here and see what will be our next step. Our next step is to tag them. So now you will see when I just write a normal tag and a tag with a hashtag, what will happen? So if I wrote just a normal tag, it will just be, now this data set is, will be called, for example, um, barcode 10. And that's it. And when I try to run a different tool or a, a tool on this sample, it will not take the tag afterwards. But in order to keep this tag on every tool that will use the sample data, we need to put a hashtag where we can promote our where we can promote our sample together. Yep, here. Like that. <laughs> I'll keep them both also to, to see what will happen afterwards. And here you also put a hashtag and then barcode 11. These are just ideas to keep track of the samples which one will be which one afterwards. So now both of them are, are tagged and both of them are finished uploading or are imported to your history. The next step that you're going to do is using one also of the coolest feature on Galaxy is that you do a collection. So instead of running each and every tool that we run afterwards or the workflows on one data set, data set at a time, Galaxy gives you the opportunity to run a collection as a whole, which is actually a very important thing. If you have hundreds of samples, not two, then you will need them to run together at the same time. You don't need to run the workflow once and on each sample. That's, yeah, saving time and also keeping track of the stuff. So to do that, we need to create a list of the samples that we have. We do that by doing, um, by selecting them together, and since, and we choose the selected samples, and here we just need to create a list. They are not a paired end samples, they are just a for, a forward or single end samples. So we'll need to choose build data set lists. And either you choose to hide the elements or to keep them in your history. This does not matter. We will at the end need the sample collection. So what I will call them here are samples collection. And this collection will be used in the all the coming steps of this workflow. And then I created the collection. So until now, we are in the we do, we have not started actually the training yet. We're just preparing our data sets that we were going to use in the training. Actually, here is everything that we have talked about, about the nanopore sequencing and why do we need that, why we need to identify all pathogens agnostically and tra track their contamination along the sequences and what are the samples are coming from, how they are spiked. So we have chicken samples spiked with different types of salmonella. And these actually are the strains or the subspecies of salmonella that we have. This is for barcode 10 and this is for barcode 11. We have created our history. We have imported our data sets, we have created the collection, and now we are good to go. So first workflow, pre-processing. So your samples now is needed definitely a pre-processing. And, and it's because actually, first of all, they are nanopore sequencing. Although the, the quality of the nanopore sequences 
sequencing nowadays are much higher than previous days. They have um, um, a lower uh, error rate than before. So actually it's much, much better to have nanopore sequencing nowadays than before. But we also need a pre-processing steps to remove duplicates, to, to retain the overall quality of the reads in the first place, and also to, to do quality controlling to see what happens before and after the quality controlling and trimming of the short reads or trimming of the, the adapters, for example. So you need to quality uh, retain your reads as a first place. And another important step that you need here in the pre-processing is to remove all the known sequences. For example, if they are food samples, they are coming from a meat or milk or some known sequences that you are not interested in. So here in the, our training, you have chicken samples. We are definitely not excited about knowing the, ch the chicken sequences. Rather, we want to identify the rest of the sequences that might be found in the sample. So we need a host removal step, which we'll be going to do in the pre-processing workflow here using some two main tools, actually. The first one of them is Minimap2, where it's a mapping tool. We will map against the reference genome of the host, which is chicken. Or in another a situation, you know that this factory is a chocolate factory. So we remove all the known sequences for chocolate, for example, and then sequence the rest. So you need just to remove your host. And to do that, first of all, we need to map to the reference genome of the known sequence. And then another polishing of this uh, host removal can be done using Kraken 2. Kraken actually is a taxonomy profiling uh, tool that can be used. And there on Galaxy, you'll find a lot of databases. And actually, if you have a very cool database that you need to add to Kraken 2, you can just contact us at any time so that we can add it for you. And Calimary, actually, one of these databases that can be used for host sequences removal, although it just includes the mitochondrial sequences of the, of the sequences that you have, it can be also helping in identifying other known sequences. So, but it's just a polishing step. You cannot depend only on Calimary because it does not, as I told you, it only includes the mitochondrial sequences, not the full genomes of the of the known sequences to be host but you can use it to identify also uh, some known sequences and also have an idea what can be a bacteria because the calimary database has some uh, sequences from bacteria and so on so you can have an idea from the pre-processing what kind of bacteria that are present in your samples so to do the, or to run the workflows, you have to import it first to Galaxy. And as a hands-on step here says, first of all, you need to download it and import it. So I will just click here to download the workflow. Now it's downloaded. It's called nanopore underscore preprocessing.ga. And I guess it's in my downloads, hopefully. <laughs> and then you need to import it to your um, Galaxy, and here you have a very cool hands-on to do that or tip to do that, but let's do it together. We'll go to the workflow section here, and then you click on import. So in this workflow section, you'll have all kind of workflows that you have created on Galaxy, or you can also click on the workflows that are shared with you. So some people created workflows and then they chose not to put it as public, but to share it only with some specific people using their email address they used on Galaxy. And then I can find it here or they are publicly available workflows now, like these workflows that you'll be using today, they are publicly available under the name Pathogy Fair, or you can just imp import it or import the one that we have downloaded together. So I will just click on import that you have seen it here, and then I will click on browse. And so I will be going on and choosing my downloaded workflow with the name nanopore preprocessing.ga. And then I will click import workflow. So now I can see the workflows as imported in my workflows. 
And what I can simply do is just click run workflow and give it the input data set as we'll go be doing together. Or as more options, you can also feel free to edit the workflow anytime and see how exactly it was created, which tools were used exactly. You can download it at any time. You can share it if you want with a specific person, then they will have it here or have um, or just give them the link or make it publicly available. You can also create a copy. So they're actually really cool to see how workflows work on Galaxy. And you can also tag them as they are already tagged here. So they're really cool actually feature in Galaxy, one of the my favorites. <laughs> So I will go on clicking play, and then I will give the collection of samples to this one. And if I have samples metadata, it's an optional input to the workflow I can also use here so that maybe um, they can um, actually, if you have um, your own sample data set along with the metadata, you can see these metadata during the visualization step that we are going to do afterwards. So for now, they will be included as a tabular format in, um, in all the outputs of this workflows, as you're going to see the outputs after this workflow finished running. Uh, and then these tabulars will be given to the visualizations that we'll be doing today afterwards. So for now, I have no samples metadata. I only have the samples collection, and then I press run workflow. So the workflow includes, um, as we you know already, quality controlling tools and mapping tools to, to identify the host. And then uh, from this mapping output, there are some tools that are um, um, tabular manipulation tools to remove um, the identified host sequences of the chicken sequences and to uh, keep only the remaining sequences that we'll be going to use in all the coming steps. So this workflow will take some time to be running. So if you want to have a break, now it's a good time to leave your workflow running and maybe read uh, the next sections, for example, of the training material. Or um, yeah, so you if you want to take a break here, you can definitely take it. For me now, I have created for you a history already with everything has already run inside. You can also use this history instead of waiting until all the work or all the tools have finished running. So for me now, I'll go to this history to be able to check the results. But I just wanted to, see, to show you how the how, for example, this tag, which named barcode 10, is not promoted. However, this tag was hashtag barcode 10, you can see in all the coming ones. Also, same as barcode 11. So now I guess you can, you can get the difference between the promoted ones. So this one is not promoted with no hashtag, so you will not see it in the coming tools. However, the hashtag ones are the one which continues to, to be seen in all the um, output of the histories. So for example, this table, you know for sure, it's a table that will include both of the barcode 10 and barcode 11 and from the title. So this is the quality retained read of all, um, quality retained of all reads. So, um, so after you finish the uh, host removal and after you finish the quality controlling and trimming of the reads, this one will, will be having all your reads. And finally, this will be the collection of the, the sequences at the end. So yeah, so let's see the real output results. Instead of waiting now, I will just go to this history. And actually, also, it's a very nice thing to see that in Galaxy, you can have your histories as public histories, and everyone can see it. So you can go now for the histories. And then you go to public history and you will find them under the name GTN 2024. So if you just, if I, you did not see them here, you can just, just search GTN and then you will have them here. And our workflow now is pre-processing. So I will just take this history now and import it to mine or just click view here. And then here is the history that you have. And what you need to do now is that you take it. So 
to see it here along with your other histories. So just click switch to this history. Yeah, and then go your home again. Now you can see the imported public history of the same exactly workflow has run on the same exactly samples. So we can check all and the results together or some specific ones, which are the most important one of them. So let's see what we have done until now. So for we imported the workflow, we gave it the samples, and then we ran the workflows. You know already that this workflow has included some quality controlling steps using FastQC and then MultiQC to uh, aggregate the results and, and see the quality of the, the reads that we're going to check together now. And also Nanoplot, it's a nice tool for nanopore reads in order, not only actually nanopore leads, but you can use it for nanopore leads um, to, to check the quality as well. And then Pore shop and fast B to trim the um, the adapters, the to remove the short reads, so to retain the quality of the overall quality of the reads that you have. And then I have for you some questions. So take some time to read the questions here and to test it yourself before looking at the coming part of the video. So maybe you can stop the video now, try to answer the questions yourself and then come back to see if you are correct or not. So the first question was the eight, uh, to check the multi-QC output for barcode 10 before and after and to see the difference. Was there any difference in the total number of reads? Are there some reads were removed uh, after the quality controlling and how many reads are remained? So how many sequences does barcode 10 contain before and after trimming? What is the quality score, overall score of the read? Is it good? And what is the importance of the quality controlling or the fast QC in, in general? So to do that, you need to go through your history and check the multi QC report before and after trimming. And also you can you check you you can also check the fast QC before and after. And the good thing about the tagging is that during the creation of the workflow itself, I said that this specific output I wanted to take this tag. So that when anyone can use the workflow and run it, they can easily see the uh, instead of reading very shortly the names, they can just see the tag clearly um, in their output. So here is the multi QC before pre processing, and then you let's see it together, which actually include both of the samples, barcode 10 and barcode 11. Where you can check the total overall overall number of reads in total, and here is the I want to actually to check the fast QC as well before. So let's go to it for barcode ten. So it's more easier to read. So you have a total number of of reads here this is before so let's see if the answer was correct correct so before trimming we have these total number of sequencing and let's check how many reads were remained after the quality controlling then you need the other fast qc report or the multi qc to check to check both samples together and the total number of reads were reduced. Not a lot, but yeah, quite few reads were removed after the quality controlling. And then in the multi QC, you can see um, how well the difference between the before and after actually. So let's go to the multi QC after trimming. And actually, this is the, the mean quality score for both of the samples after the quality controlling. So as you can see, they are in the medium range. They are still, they are not yet in the red threat score, 
So the higher the number here, the higher the FRET score, the better the quality. So it would be perfect if it was in the, gr the green area. But since they are nanopore reads and also they are um, samples that are created specifically for the training. So they are very short samples so, so that your histories can run fast and your workflows can run very fast. So they are not the, the actual real example of the sample. So when you have a, your sequencing from the lab, you should be expecting something in the above the 25 FRET score, which would be much better than what the case now. But actually, if you check the multi-QC before, you will find it in the red zone. So now the quality has been retained a bit, but in a real case example, you always should expect your quality before actually trimming to be much better than that, specifically in the middle parts, not the beginning and not the end. So let's go back to the multi-QC before to see the, the FRET score. Yeah, as you can see here, the beginning and end of the reads of both of the samples, barcode 10 and barcode 11, were completely in the red zone. So that's what the quality controlling by using um, um, shop and PASP helped the reads to be above the, the red zone of the FRET score. And we entered the area between 20 and 25, which is good for us to go for now. So yeah, so the fast QC and the multi QC is actually very important to help you have an overall idea about what's going on in your in your samples. So multi QC can show you all the samples at the same time. Fast QC can show you sample by sample. It's a very good reports to see the number or the percentage of duplicate reads before and after your trimming. So it's really important to see what uh, what you need from the trimming. So based on the quality controlling before trimming, you will know exactly what parameters to set for the trimmers. Where exactly does the adapter take place from which base to which base that you need to remove? Um, maybe you find them totally will not be recovered. So you need to get back to the lab and ask them to resequence again your samples and you have it. So it's really important to to have an idea about the reads before you move forward so that you can trust the output at the end. So yeah, so FastQC is a very nice tool to show you and actually, yeah, you can export figures, you can always share the, the report with anyone, either by the link directly or yeah. So you can download plots and share it as much as you want. So here is the answer. Hopefully you got the same numbers after you ran the history. Yep, and then comes the next step of the pre-processing where we had whole sequencing, um, sequences removal or whole street filtering where we used mapping tool. Here we use mini, mini map tool, which is also good for the nanopore reads, but it's not specific to nanopore reads. You can also use it for Illumina sequences read. And we map to chicken since we know that these samples are coming, for example, from a chicken factory. Uh, so the sample is from chicken, so we needed to remove the chicken. And then we move forward with the samples which were not chicken and do another polishing step with Calimary database using Kraken 2 for taxonomy profiling. And if we found any other type of, of, um, of host sequences, like any other type of meat, so samples may include since they are coming from the factory, it may include other type of sequences. So it's good also to discover them using Kelly Mary um, database using Kraken 2. And then you keep only the sequences which were not any of their previous and continuous the ones that you did not know or you did not identify. So I also give you some time to check the question. So stop the video and have a look about this question, see if you can answer it or not and then come back and see the answer. So the question basically asks you how many number of chicken were found in your samples. And this question, you can answer it by checking multiple files actually in your history. So you can either uh, check this one, removed host percentage tab table. So this table is an output of of everything else. So after the minimap tool has finished running and the Kraken 2 tools using Calimary has finished running, 
uh, there are some other tools used in the workflow that you can check either with the long version or the uh, or the by checking the workflow itself by editing it to cut and remove some of the um, table outputs and to filter only uh, the, the, the reads that were under identified as chicken and remove them the, from the total number of sequences or from the uh, sequences of every single uh, sample that you have. So, and then it calculates by counting and calculating some percentages, the mean and everything. So you can use some ta tabular manipulation tools that you can get from text manipulation here. And actually you can play around every single tabular output you can, can have, and you can calculate and do a lot of other calculations. But here you can see that we have two samples here are the, um, the reads after we do quality controlling. So if you remember, these were the reads that were remaining after the trimming of the reads or bad quality reads and doing quality controlling. And here are the total number of reads that were identified as chicken. So here are the chicken reads that we found after we did the quality controlling. So the percentage of the chicken that found in the sample is 58% uh or almost 59 percent of the reads which is much of expected because if it's a sample that it's coming from a chicken it should be and uh, until i guess 90 percent as well can be all uh can can be all chicken and only a few percent is the things that you want to identify and see what is there so since yeah so 58 percent of this of the samples are chicken is a quite reasonable answer. If you find it less than that, you can ask your sequencing company, have you, they did a depletion, for example, or a removal of the host before they give you the, the samples or not? Because if you, if they didn't, then they must repeat the sequencing again, because most of the majority of the sequence should be the host actually in this situation. Yeah, so you can check it, um, check it from here. Or you can check also the output from Calamary uh, database um, and also the total number of sequences that were found here. For example, here is uh, the total number of reads before we found the chicken. So you can see the output of um, Minimap2. So, so here, for example, these are BAM files that give you an idea of the sequences that are assigned. So these are the output of Minimap2. So the mapped ones and the unmapped ones. And then, yeah, you can check it by multiple ways. So hopefully you get the same solution. <laughs> yeah, for barcode 10 and also you can check it for barcode 11. And then here is the final question is, or the final part of this workflow, which is filter host assigned to reads based on Kraken 2. So the output of Minimap 2 was used to uh, go to Kraken 2 using Calimary. And actually in this situation, in this example, you find out that Calimary did not identify more chicken sequences or actually uh, uh, meat or milk. So it did not remove more. Furthermore, so, so the polishing step did not uh, remove uh, actually, it removes few of the sequences, but not all of, the, not a lot more, because Minimap two has already done the job, and they were already all chicken. But if the samples in the in your test case has included other types of uh, of host sequences, they will be removed by Calimary or Kraken two. Yeah. So if your histories has already finished, so if you remember, we already have your histories here. If they are already done or already green, you can use them directly. If not, like my case here, you can use uh, the import again and import the output of the pre-processing to run and continue the rest of the training with the rest of the workflows. So you can proceed on by copying the output of the pre-processing workflow for every sample. So you copy here the samples here. Let's create a new history and call it the next one is taxonomy profiling so let's call it taxonomy yeah 
profiling. <laughs> and today's day as well so it can help you track and maybe here just give it um any tag you like so taxonomy and also it would be nice if you can give it the name of the tutorial anything that you like <laughs> and then you click save so that will be your history for the taxonomy profiling for now, and then you, up, you upload your data set same way. So paste and fetch, and then you click here and then press start. So these are the pre-processed sample reads. So the output from the pre-processing workflow, sample by sample. So you will next step is to tag them like we did for the original samples and to create a collection. So you already know how to do this now. Tagging like here, barcode 10. And here you can call it barcode 11. Yeah. And after, maybe you don't need to wait as well. So here you can just create the, the list and let's name it pre-processed samples. Let me give you a full overview of what we are going to be next to do next. So the first step that we have already done together is pre-processing the samples that we have. And the cool thing in this workflow that every coming workflow can run in parallel. So you don't need to wait for one of them to finish to run the other because you already have your, your processed samples. And what you need to do next is taxonomy profiling, identifying genes based on their um, pathogenicity as you're going to see together, identifying some variants and doing variant calling so each one of the coming workflow can run in parallel, so you don't need to wait. And the first one of them is the taxonomy profiling. So let's go on and check this workflow together. So as we did before, to pre-processing -pre workflow, you need to download the taxonomy profiling workflow. So just click here, leave it to download, and then you need to import it to your Galaxy. So all you need to do again is go to workflows, click import, and then you browse and import your, it's named uh, taxonomy profiling and visualization with Corona. So you click on it and then click on import workflow. And now your workflow is imported. So let's go here and you click directly run workflow. All you need to do here is to give it the pre-processed samples and ident identify the Kraken data database that you're going to, you to be using in the, in the taxonomy profiling that you'll be doing. So for now here, you have these all databases already installed in Galaxy. And as I told you, for Kraken 2 or any type of database, whenever you want an extra database to be added to any one of the tools, not doesn't have to be a Kraken 2, just contact us and we can add it for you. For now, we can use as the training here, the standard plus PF, one of the standard databases for the tool, for which include the protozoa and fungi. And here is the version date that we are going to use it. So let's choose it from the menu together. Yeah, it is this one. Our, it's protozoa and fungi, so this one. And then please click run workflow. Also, it will take time to finish running. So let's go to the already published history. To do that so that we can check the results together and we can check which tools we have used and what is the output of the workflow so we go together to um, histories and then we go to public history 
and you search by tag GTN. And then you choose the taxonomy profiling history, then click view. And then switch to this history so that you can import it to yours. And finally, go back to your current home so that you can check it. Now we have our finished history of the taxonomy profiling so that we can check it together. So there are um, a lot of tools to do taxonomy profiling. And for our situation here, our nanopore grids and um, our shotgun metagenomic sequences, we chose Kraken tool to use here in the workflow, but feel free anytime to try changing the workflow yourself by editing and try different types of other tools. So as you can see here, there are a lot of tools that you can choose by category. And for the taxonomy profiling, you will find a lot of them as well here. So feel free to choose from all the cool, cool actually, <laughs> tool catalog here and try different type of taxonomy profiling. And also for visualization, here we use Corona pie chart which is the famous one to use for Krona visualization, but also Galaxy includes some um, very nice interactive tools um, uh, to use for taxonomy profiling like Finch um, that you can also check um, in Galaxy and also include some, uh, which also includes some visualization and interactive ones. And as you know, by now, everything with Galaxy is shareable and downloadable, so you can always share um, your plots and figures whenever you want and histories, of course. So yeah, so this workflow is as short as possible. We take the pre-processed samples from the pre-processing workflow. We run Kraken2 with the chosen database that the user can choose anyone they use based on the, the, the situation. For, for us now, we want to identify bacteria to see which one of them can be pathogenic or not to have an idea about what is there in general and the abundances that are there in each one of the sample of each one of the identified uh, bacteria and other microbial community. And finally, we want to visualize it with one of the visualization tool, Corona PyChai. So let's see together the questions of this workflow and see if we can answer it together. So again, you know it by now, post the um, uh, video and try to answer yourself first before you continue. So for barcode 10, we want to know what is the most common species found and what is the second most common species found, how many sequences were classified and how many are not classified at all. Um, what is the difference between the Kraken 2 run here using uh, the standard plus uh, database and what we used before in the pre-processing workflow using Calibari? Yeah. So let's answer one by one. Let me first show you the Corona pie chart output. So here you can see the all the samples that you have for us. Now we have only barcode 10 and barcode 11. You can click on any category you want and or any uh, rank. You, you need to see more into details and see it in more details. For example, now we can see that we have Salmonella as a genus level 27% found. And then, yeah, so you can click on whatever category you want to see. And also, not only by Corona pie chart, you can also look at the uh, output report of the Kraken 2 directly for barcode 10. And you can see the total number of reads as well here. From, for example, here you have Salmonella, and how many number of reads and so on. And then the second uh, species that you can found and so on. So let's check together the solution. So the first found species, as you can see here, at genus level was Salmonella with 9,950 reads. And then the second, let's see at genus level was um, Kulai. So let's see if it was there. Really or not? Yes, it was there. And the total number of reads was 1,949. Also, you can see that with the Corona pie chart. With the, here, when you click on, click on Salmonella, let's go for barcode 10 first. 
and then you have the genus and you have the total number of reads that were assigned to the genus rank uh, of salmonella and then you can go for the rank of coli here is the um, species you can also go to the rank and then you read the total number of reads that you found yeah so either by checking the report or checking the corona pie chart you can get the total number of reads anyways so let's see how to see how many number of reads were classified and how many not actually from the report you can see here some of the main things that you can read so and one of them is for example we have these total number of sequences before we do anything else and then we have almost 36,000 were classified and the rest were unclassified. And same you can do for the output of Kraken 2 with Calimary of the pre-processing and check if you got it the same or not. So with Calimary, it was also able to identify some, um, some bacteria, species and, and subspecies at genus and and all different type of ranks. And with Calimary, the most fine, uh, found one was Kulai, with this total number of sequences. And then the second was Salmonella. And then the total number of classified were 30,000. And the unclassified were 6,874. So actually, it's, yeah. So by using the standard plus PF, we have more classified sequences than the one that we have using using Kelly Mary. So as you can see, the choice of the database can can differ a lot in the total number of classified sequences. And the more classified, the better. And also, you need to check for biases. So so also, it's not always good that you have more classified sequences because they can be easily classified wrong. So you need to choose your database nicely and we need to search of the what is the best database can be used for your samples based on your test case situation yeah and some of the other tools as i told you is sponge visualization which is present in galaxy also pavian tool is also a nice interactive tool all of them can be found in galaxy to visualize the output of kraken 2 so you can just take the output as is you can run some tools like creating a biome file from the report. There is a Kraken biome tool that you can find in Galaxy. You can search here Kraken biome. Yeah, and then this tool can help you convert the output report here. So you can give it the collection report of Kraken tool, like here, for example, and then you you can also give a database metadata of the samples here and then you can run the the tool and then you have your biome file which you can use it to run the finch interactive tool and pavian to have interactive reports along with the metadata so until now we have reached the taxonomy profiling you have an idea what are the bacteria that might be or might not be a pathogen until now you did no identification of the pathogen you did not know but you have an idea that there might be a salmonella in your samples based on, and coli as well based on the output from the pre-processing uh, crack into with calimary and also the taxonomy profiling was the standard plus pf so let's see if these salmonella are pathogenic or not or if there are other identified pathogens that we did not yet see in the corona pie chart and that's why we need actually the third workflow, which is gene-based pathogen identification. And as I told you, any of the coming workflow, you can run in parallel. So if your taxonomy profiling is still running and uh, you don't want to look on the hint of the public histories, which we look together, you can just leave it and run directly the gene-based pathogen identification. So you don't need to wait for the taxonomy profiling at all for this step. So what you need to run this gene-based pathogen identification is the output from the pre-processing, which are the pre-processed samples. So again, you go on and download the workflow from here and you import it to your Galaxy instance. So now when you have the gene-based pathogen identification workflow downloaded, 
we go on to Galaxy and import it as a previous workflows from here. Then you browse it and then choose the gene-based pathogen identification. And then you click open and import. Before you run the workload, don't forget to create a new history. You can also run all workflows on, in, in one history. You don't have to create different histories, but for now I'm asking you to do that so that you can keep track of each and every single part of the workflow that you can get back to it, you can change. So they are much more easier for us now to, to see and check. So you can also run everything uh, in a single history as you like. So it's not a must to create a history whenever you want to run a new workflow, just for the sake of the tutorial and that we can see every part on its own. So let's create the, the history, rename it gene-based pathogen identification. And then maybe here today's day. And then you can tag it anything. So now I cannot keep track because they are all with different names. <laughs> so yeah, and we save. And then we go on to run the workflow. But before we do that, you remember we need a uh, data to start with. And either you take the pre-processing output, the, um, the output of the pre-processing, if it's already finished running, you can just take it. If not, you can also import um, the samples from the as we from the uh, pre-processing part as we did for the taxonomy profiling. Or you do this cool stuff here that I'll be going to show you now. Is that you can copy some data sets from previous history from previous histories to your history using this copy data sets. So here, for example, we can just go to the taxonomy profiling and we take the collection that we created together using the imported samples or the uploaded samples that we uploaded from the tutorial. Remember, this is the history of the taxonomy profiling we did together. We imported these two files or we uploaded these two files from the links and then we created this collection together. We can just copy this collection directly to our gene-based pathogen identification workflow and we will have it in our history directly so we don't have to copy again and upload it again and yeah so you can just copy it and choose from any source history to any destination history as you like so let's get back to our workflows to our imported ones and this is the last one that we imported together let's click on one and here the workflow just takes the samples and you can run workflow. Let's get back to our training material and see what exactly does this work workflow do. The first step the workflow does is to create context from our samples data. So the first thing, we run a tool called Metafly so that we can create some context. And we polish these created contexts using a tool called Medaka Consensus Pipeline. It's a, also a very nice tool that is recommended for polishing the output from the any created context. And then this output context we use in order to identify the genes that are pathogenic. This one can be done by a tool, another tool called Abrigate. This Abrigate tool has a lot of databases. One of them is to, to help identifying the violence factor genes which gives you a clear idea about the pathogenic genes, about what is the gene products, where exactly this gene is allocated in your genome or in the sample, um, what is exactly uh, it's resistant to. So a lot of information you can get for out of this databases. And these databases are present in Abrigate. So one of them is for the violence vector identification. And the other that we are going also to do in this workflow is antimicrobial resistance genes. And we do that using also one of the databases in Abrigate. So we create context and then we identify the pathogenic genes and the antimicrobial resistance genes using Abrigate tool. So cool, right? <laughs> 
And yeah, and then you can answer some of the questions here, but you cannot do that until your history is done. Or you can just go again and check the public history that's already created for you. Also with the name GTN 2024, and you choose the gene-based pathogen identification, click on view and then switch to history, and then go to home. In this workflow, as you know by now, we do we have the collection that we started with. Then the, the workflow runs in order to, first of all, run the Metafly in order to create some context, which are really important for us to run the aggregate tool, which I also want to show you, which can, yeah, you can just directly see the tool together. This tool is simply taking the Create a context for all samples together using the collection of contexts that you have created. And you can choose from different databases. One of them is the violence factor database that identify all the violence factor genes. The, you can also use the NCBI bacteria antimicrobial resistance um, reference gene database to identify antimicrobial resistant genes. You can also identify multiple stuff by using one of the existing databases in the tool. So actually, the output of the tool is also very cool. So that's the initial output without any um, playing around with the tables yet or any manipulation of the tool. So we have the idea which sample it is, which on which context you found this gene, at which position, starting and ending position of the of the is the gene found in on the contact, and what is the name of this gene? What is the coverage and the co mapping coverage? Is it the percentage of the coverage? And what is the accession ID that you can use um, to to identify that using the NCBI? And what is the product of this gene? And what is is what is it resistant against? So you can have here some idea about the, the, the pathogenic genes from which bacteria, for example, you can see here the salmonella for barcode 10, exactly the same uh, species or subspecies that we have. We know that our sample is spiked with or the chicken was spiked with some other pathogenic genes. So everything that was identified as pathogen in the gene can be identifying identified using this tool after we do a context or after we create create our context so yeah but as you can see here it's just the tables so that's why we need the rest of the workflows to create some cool figures at the end that you're going to see in order to be able to um, track the presence of this pathogen and to see where exactly it's present. And um, yeah, and the how much the, each and every gene is abundant in your sample. So yeah. So let's together try and solve these questions. So again, pause the video and try to answer the questions yourself after the what your workflow has finished running or using the created history of the, of the workflow. So the first question is how many contexts were created by Fly? And then how many contexts were removed after Medaka has did some polishing for the created context? And after there is also a tool that you, you can run to see um, or to visualize the context created and to see how the contexts are connected together. So let's see it together as well. So first of all, to see how many contexts were created, you need to check the fly output first, which is samples of or sample or context output. You can see it for barcode 10. So you have 124 sequences created. So 124 contexts created in, in for barcode 10 and seven uh, contexts were created for barcode 11. And then let's see what happened after we run Medaka consensus sequences. And here you can see it in context, I guess, because these are the ones after we polished. So it's still 124. 
and this one is still seven. That means that the quality of the uh, context created by uh, by Metafly was very good. So Medaka did not polish or remove any sequences. So it kept for barcode 10, we have 124. And for barcode 11, we have seven uh, context created. Then let's check together the bandage image for, for barcode 10 and barcode 11. So here are how the 124 context created for barcode 10 connected together. And since also the sample, as you know, was specifically designed for the test case to be very short. So we removed a lot of reads already before we give you the test sample. The context actually did not all together uh, match together or somehow connected together, but supposedly a good um, context created has to be somehow connected together because they come from the same sample somehow. So like this one, for example, all contexts were connected together at the end, although they are just seven. But I mean, if you, it's a real sample um, without any removal or just directly from the, from the sequencing uh, company to you, you must see some patterns in how the contexts are connected together and also some uh, plasmids, for example. Let me see if we can find any plasmid example here like these ones, for example. So yeah, let's see if we got the same here. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> That's for barcode 10. Yeah, let's have a look now for the antimicrobial resistant genes created using Abrogate. So the question for you now is how many AMR genes were created for barcode 10 and barcode 11, and what are they mainly? And so basically you read the output tables that you have uh, seen already with me, but for the antimicrobial resistant genes, so you can check here, the AMR identified by the NCBI database using Abrogate. So you can see here that for barcode 10, we have seven lines, that means seven different genes. Let's see if some of them are the same or not. So we have um, the, we have repeated ones. So we have the same gene found twice um, on different contexts of the sample. And you can have more idea about that by reading the product of which gene product is that and what is it resistant to. So. Yeah, and for barcode 11, did we got any? Yes, we got two antimicrobial genes. And again, here are there some information about them and what are they resistant to? Yeah, hopefully you get the same results. And then you can move forward to check the violence factor genes or the pathogenic genes the most important part actually of the training today to see the violence factors or the pathogenic genes that you have. And let's see how many ones you found for barcode 10 and barcode 11. So again, you check the VF of the genes identified by the violence factor database. Here you have 188 genes identified and for barcode 11, you have 287 genes identified. And again, all possible information you can find about them is here. So yeah, 188 and 287, good to go. Now to the last but not least, to the fourth workflow, the allele-based pathogen identification, where we want to use the output from the pre-processing in order to do some variant calling and yeah, to do to identify some variants in our reads. And to do that, we need to download the workflow as usual and import one more data set. So yeah, as you remember until now, we can run any of the workflows now in parallel. So taxonomy profiling can run in parallel to the gene-based pathogen identification, as well as allele-based pathogen identification. So all of these three workflows can run together in a row or in parallel, so you don't need to wait. All of them takes the output from the pre-processing workflow 
and produce some tabular important output to us. So the, the taxonomy profiling produced um, a taxonomy ab ab abundance table to know we, what, what are the microbial communities that we have and um, how much the, each one of them, each specific rank is abundant in the samples. The gene-based pattern identification gave us um, a FASTA file with all the context created, gave us two important tables with all the uh, identified pathogens or, or the pathogenic genes in our samples and their location and which context they are, they are created on, how much they are, uh, what are they resistant against and what are they actually in the first place. They, uh, the the gene-based pathogen identification gave us also a table for the antimicrobial resistant genes. So until now, we only have tables. And also this workflow that can run in parallel, the allele-based pathogen identification will give us um, um, an important table, which is the, the variants uh, that are found in your in the in the samples that we have. And as well that we are going also to do some important stuff that we will also have it as tables. And then I will not ruin it for you, but let's see the tables first and then let's see at the end how we are going to visualize it or visualize all the previous parts. So let's go to the allele-based pathogen identification and download the workflow. And then also copy the FASTA file from here. I will tell you what is that now. Let's we'll just copy it from here and then go to the Galaxy um, instance that you have. The first thing that you do that just create a new history, call it allele-based. And then give it today's day here, for example, give it some cool tag, anything that you can keep track afterwards with. So like this, and then you click save. And then you need to import the workflow. So you click import from the workflow section, you browse and choose your allele based pathogen identification. A workflow that you have just downloaded and then you click on import workflow. You also need some input data sets. So as you learn by now, you can copy the data sets from here, from one history to another. So you can copy it from the gene base this time, just in terms of some change. <laughs> so you can choose the collection created with the pre-processed samples, the output from the pre-processing workflow and copy it to the allele-based pathogen identification history here. And then you can import the file that we have copied from your um, training material, which is the um, reference genome of the salmonella. So then here we just click start and let's go and to the training material again and see what does this workflow does in details. So by now, from the pre-processing workflow, we already did a Kraken um, 2 tool. We run that tool using Calimary database, which gave us an idea about the bacteria that might be there. So it was used initially for host removal. However, it also helped us identify some of the bacteria. And we had some, for example, like the most abundant one was, was E. coli and uh, the second most abundant was Salmonella. So we you are now a bit doubting some of the pathogens that might be there in your samples. And also one of the important things to do using the microbial data that you have is also by identifying is to identify the variants in your in your samples and the SMPs in your sample. So it was important and it's still important to have this part of the workflow. So that's why we have it along with the main workflows for the pathogen identification because it helps to identify more variants and maybe in some situations it also can help you identified actually a new variant for the pathogen itself. So you can find the pathogen, not only that, you can identify a variant for this pathogen by having this variant calling part in the 
overall workflow of the pathogen identification. So to do that, you need uh, in the beginning to map to a reference genome. And this reference genome is a doubt that you have. And here we want to test our um, samples against salmonella. That's why we uploaded the reference genome from, from the cell, for the salmonella to our workflow or to the, our history. And then we will be using it to identify the SMPs. And then from the mapping, we'll not only be doing that, we want also to test the quality uh, of the um, identified uh, variants or SMPs. And to do that, we need to have um, the mapping coverage. And um, yeah, so you need to know the coverage of the mapping and the, how much the variants are covered are um, by reference genome and the depths of the, the mapping so that you can trust your variants that were identified during the variant calling. So the first step is to do a mapping in this workflow, then you identify the variants and then you check the quality of the variants by seeing or looking about the, the mapping that you already did, the coverage and the depths of your maps. Um, you also use some important tools to filter uh, your identified SMPs or identified variants. So this workflow is actually important to, to do these steps or to identify the variants and the quality of them and maybe um, a new variant for the pathogen that you, your samples have. So let's go step by step and let's run the workflow together. So we go back to your workflows. We have already imported it. So it's go just run the workflow. It will ask you for the pre-processed samples or the collection of the pre-processed samples. We will be asked also for the reference genome for salmonella here. If you want to test your sample against E. coli, for example, because we found it in the pre-processing, we can also try to, to see if we can find our sample include a variant for the E. coli as well. So you can also do it from here and you can just um, download a reference genome from the NCBI and import it here as well. And here you're asked as an optional to choose the sample profile. So our samples were Oxford Nanopore data sets, so I can just choose nothing and make it automatically identified, or you can just go on and choose the Oxford Nanopore reads. Yeah, so just go on and run the workflow. So let's see which tools were used for this workflow. This workflow used Minimap2 in order to do, to do the mapping. And then we use Clear 3 in order to do the variant calling. So Clear 3 actually is one of the not newest, but it's one of the current tools that are used for the uh, SMP calling or variant calling. And actually, um, uh, there are some other tools, but they are favoring Clear 3. So um, after doing some research, Clear 3 um, proved to do or to perform better than other tools as well. So that's why we use it here. But also there are a lot of other tools that can do that. And they are present in Galaxy as well. So you can go on and try a lot of the variant calling tools that you can find on Galaxy and also other um, tools that can do filtering. So as you can see here, they are categorized here by genomics uh, analysis and there is a full category of the variant calling and based on your reads and based on uh, your sampling conditions, you can choose it from a lot of variant calling tools, but for now we have used Clear 3. So, you after that some of other tools we use to do normalization and filtering you can also filter by column you can keep only the quality the the variance that's above a certain quality score from the quality column that you will have from the output from clear 3 and then you can also use some sam tools um, to calculate the depths and coverage from your mapping output um, from minimap 2 so 
there are a lot of tools that you can use in order to filter and analyze your varying column, but still all of the outputs are tables. So instead of waiting, I will just begin leave this history here and go again to one of the public histories that you can find here under GTN. And then you can find it as a lead based pathogen identification. You click view and then switch to history. And then you go to home again. And you find all the outputs already green. So let's see the questions that you have here and we try to answer them together. So the first question that we have is about Claire 3. And the first question was, how many variants were found by CLAIR3 for barcode 10? And how many variants were found after we quality filtered the output of CLAIR3 using the, the one of the filtering tools, the low freq filter here? So how many tools, uh, how many variants were remained after we do the filtering? So let's together go and check the CLAIR3 output from here. Yeah, for barcode 10, as you can see, we have 2,812 lines, 15 comments. So that means we have 2,812 variants found in our samples. So let's see if that was correct or not. Yes, it was correct. So finally, let's see how many were remained after we do the filtering. So we go to the output of the filtration. Most probably it's, they are renamed to quality filtered VCF output. And we go to check for barcode 10 and the remaining was 2,642. So around 100 plus variants were removed based on the quality score that they have from Clear 3. Yeah, the answer is correct. And then let's check the output of the mapping depths and coverage. So as you know, after we run Minimap2 tool, we have a BAM file as an output. This BAM file you give to the SAM tools, depths and coverage um, tools to calculate the depths and of your, how many, how many reads were covering a specific part or how many nucleotide exactly is covering a specific nucleotide of the reference genome. So how much you have in depth and how much your reads are covering the full reference genome. So that's actually the basic difference between coverage and depth. So if your reads of your sample is covering the full reference genome of salmonella, how much we have coverage and how much a specific part of your reference genome is is having is covered by a specific part of your of your reads. So if you have a lot of reads covering this specific part, then you have a higher depth, or just two reads is covering this part, then you have a lower depth and so on. And the higher the depths and the higher the coverage, the more trusted the variant callings are. So if you have a variant at this specific location and this specific location is, is covered by a lot of reads, and uh, then you should trust this variant. So, and I guess um, the, the variant caller calling people or the experts in valuing calling expect to have at least 10 uh, reads or 10 depths. So the depths is 10 by 10 reads coverage or the depths is 10. And then they can start to trust the variants that they, are, that, that they have identified by any of the variant calling tools. So yeah, but still all of that here are tables. And when you have hundreds of samples, it's really hard to see. So that's why I'm just keeping uh, to, to push you to the final workflow where we can visualize everything that we have as tables and you can see clearly where exactly you find the pathogen, how, where, where exactly is the high steps, to which exactly location and so on. Yeah. So let's see the questions that you have here. And the question is how well the sample reads covering the reference genome of Salmonella. So remember our pre-processed samples are, should be only Salmonella supposedly in this situation. And the, the other situation should be 
like more pathogens if there were many pathogens in your samples and so on. So you should be expecting a high coverage. So let's go to the coverage output and let's see the mapping percentage coverage. And as you can see for barcode 10 is 99.6% of the reads that we have after we did the pre-processing. So we removed all the chickens. So all the reads now are supposedly mostly the pathogens. And we doubted the salmonella and we mapped against the salmonella and we find out that the our reads are covering 99% of the reference genome of salmonella. So at least also we have um, more confirmation that the that the sample is mainly salmonella and the pathogen exists. And also you can check the depth at any time you want and you find that at least you have uh, for barcode 11, this is the average uh, depth or the mean depth that you have uh, for, so at every location and you find out that at, at every location we have almost 18 reads depth or covering this specific part or this specific nucleotide of the reference genome. And here it's six, which is a low, uh, low number of reads. As we said, we should expect at least 10, and then we start trusting all the variants that we found. So that means, for example, if we find a lot of variants for, bar for barcode 10, we should not really trust these variants. So we cannot call that we found a new variant for salmonella in, present in our sample, and we should identify that as a new thing, because we really do not really trust the variants that we have here. Yeah, so a very exciting thing or topic to, to study more and, or even update the workflows more um, to have more analysis for the variant calling. So it's, it's actually really important to have in a pathogen identification thingy. Yeah, finally, let's go on, or maybe before I go to the last workflow, which is the most excited one for me, let me tell you that also one of the things that you can do since you already done some mapping and you have a lot, um, you can add whatever analysis that you can have. And here we just created the consensus genome uh, from the reads that we have. So if you, for example, found a variant, a lot of variants, and, and you want to create a consensus genome for this new variant of the salmonella, you need some tools to do that. And one of them is a BCF tool consensus where you can build um, a, a genome from the, from the reads of the samples, from your own sample, and then give it out if it's a, really a new variant that you found. So how many sequences did you get for the sample? We said two because the reference genome already has a um, of salmonella on NCBI has already two sequences, the complete genome and the plasmid genome. And definitely the one that you will create is, will also have two of them. And why? That was the explanation that I was just said. Yeah. Finally, the most exciting one for me is the final workflow which will not run in parallel because you, you need to wait until the taxonomy profiling has finished, the gene-based pathogen identification is done, and the allele-based pathogen identification is done. And you take all the output from everywhere and you visualize it using a lot of tools that were created uh, in this workflow. You can still, after you download it and import it to Galaxy, you can see each and every tool used to do that. And you can also have more tools and more visualization as much as possible. We try to use a lot of cool features in Galaxy to do them. I will also even show you more that is already existing in Galaxy that you can do on spot. You can also use um, uh, integrated uh, Python scripts and or um, so a lot of other scripts to do visualization, R scripts to do more visualization. So, so not only you can use the tools that are already existing in Galaxy, you can use the platforms that are integrated within Galaxy to do more scripts for visualization. So here, where we create some cool figures to visualize all the previous tables that we had before from previous workflows. So let's go move on to download the workflow, which will be supposedly somewhere here, here. So go and download it. 
from here. And if all the previous workloads that you have um, run did not yet finish, so then you can just simply copy all the tables that you have from all the previous workloads from here, and we create collections for them. So, so if your histories has already done, then you can use the, the copy data sets, sorry, copy data sets feature that you can have and copy from all the previous histories of the taxonomy profiling, gene-based pathogen identification, allele-based pathogen identification, copy the, uh, the ones that are mentioned here. This will be already tagged or named like that exactly in your history, or you just copy the files directly from here. Or the last option is you can, you can go to the history and then have this history and take the files from there. We can also actually do that. So first of all, let's create a new history and call it maybe visualizations <laughs> or visualization and tracking as well. It's actually sample aggregation because all the previous things were like barcode 10 and barcode 11 were kind of separated, not together, but now we are going to aggregate all samples. And if you have hundreds of samples, you will aggregate them together in this workflow. So this workflow actually should be called, or it's actually called aggregation and visualization. Uh, aggregation. Okay. And visualization. And then you can also today's day so that you, you're not confused here. Maybe you write pathogen training. You should actually make the tags exactly the same so that you can use them usefully. But now we, I just use different names. So they're not really useful for me now, but for you just make sure to have similar tags so that you can identify all related histories together. So yeah, let's have this history and then we go to public histories. We have the GTN and then you choose samples aggregation and visualization, you click view and then switch to this history and go back to home. You can just copy the, um, the collections from here. Instead of collecting them from here, you can just go on and collect them from here as well. So either this, that, or from your own histories, the taxonomy, gene-based, allele-based, so you copy it from there, from here, or from the training, wherever you want. So let's copy them. These are actually the names. So you go on copy the VFs. This is a collection of uh, barcode 10 and 11 um, virulence factor genes, identified uh, AMR genes, contigs, and also the, the original output from the abricate, which is uh, AMR and virulence factor as well. So these mainly things and you also want the mapping coverage and mapping depth so you will also need to copy that so you copy the mapping mean depths oh yeah from the pre-processing workflow as well you take the total number um, of um, hosts the chicken as well too so also you can visualize how many chickens uh, or generally how many hosts were found in the samples so you actually visualize all kinds of tables that we have. So you go and copy the mapping coverage, the mapping depths, the total number of variants that you have from the variants calling. So all the variants you have for all the samples together, all these tables you, you take and all the collections also you take and then make sure. So I copied removed host sequence percentage, mapping coverage percentage, mapping mean depths, so this one you have from the pre-processing workflow history and these two you have, or these three you have from the allele-based pathogen identification history. And finally, these uh, five collections you will have as an output of the gene-based pathogen identification history. So you can copy this from the gene-based, you copy these from the allele-based pathogen identification. And finally, the first one you copied from the pre-processing workflow then feel free to copy them, choose the correct destination, which is, we call it aggregation and visualization history. And then I go on and click copy history items. Then I go back to this history. So I go to data histories, 
then I click on aggregation and visualization. Here you go. I find all the outputs from all the previous histories. So all the input data set that I need is here. So then let's go on and download the workflow. You click on download, click on it here, it downloads. And then you go to workflows, click import. You're now an expert, I'm sure. <laughs> we did it, that's the first time we do. So you may now uh, are a bit ahead of me. So here you choose the pathogen detection, um, visualization sample aggregation. Here, this one. So sample aggregation and visualization.ga. So that's a workflow and then you click import and all your, all your data sets are ready. So, sorry, I clicked something by mistake. Okay, so all the, the data sets are ready in the history. So we are good to run the workflow. Click on run. We put every collection in its correct place. So AMR identified by NCBI, there's a collection for that. Here, there is a collection for that. If we have a metadata, please put it here. I just made it in the workflow as an optional because you might not have it. It's okay as well. And then you removed a host percentage table from the pre-processing workflow, the mapping mean depth, table from the allele based or the AMRs found. So this is like a reduced table from the output of the aggregate tool that we use with AMR. And also the mapping coverage, just make sure to put each one in the corresponding. So the namings of that was actually the output of the workflow. So we did not rename anything. And these names is already um, done for you in the workflow of the aggregation. So names will always match for you, regardless of the different um, samples you will use. If you use the same exact workflows, you will find out that the, the names are always the same. It, it will be named for you within the workflow, which is also a cool thing that you set within creating your workflows. So here we choose the context that we have. And finally, here are the VFs. Now every single collection is in its place and we are good to run the workflow. Again, this workflow will take some time. So either you go back to the um, public history and check the results or you wait. So if you're decided to wait, just take a break. Actually, <laughs> if you're, you're watching the video, you must have been tired now. So take some break to wait for this workflow, or you go directly and check it from the public histories with the GTN name. And it's called Agri Samples Aggregation and Visualization. We actually was there a few seconds ago. And yeah, we don't need to switch because we have it. Yeah, so let's see some of the visualizations that this workflow does. This workflow creates some heat maps using heat map tool with ggplot. And so it's now does not appear here, but we will show, we will see it together in the, in the output of the, the history or the output of the workflows in our histories. So this heat maps, or let's go and check it directly here. You'll find it under the name heat map. Yeah. Yeah, good. We can definitely zoom in and out. Yeah, so let's zoom out to have an idea about the, the heat map in general. So the heat maps are really important to put all the virulence factor genes or the pathogenic genes together um, in an abundance uh, or clustered map so that you can see all the samples together. So here is sample barcode 10, and here, here is barcode 10, and here is barcode 11. And here are all the virulence factor genes or the pathogenic genes found. If you have 10 samples, you'll find all the samples here. So you can easily see how much these samples are sharing some of the pathogens. So if I ask you, 
what are the pathogenic genes um, that are found and in, in, in common in all the samples. So here you have two samples. You will just look at the shared one. You also see the abundance. For example, this dark red line here is a gene that is found four times for barcode 11 and just one time for uh, barcode 10, for example. So the darker the abundance here, you have a legend below. I don't know if you can see it. That tells you the value based on the color. So four is a dark red. So at least the gene is found four times in the same sample, for example. You can see if some of the genes can only be found in, in one sample and not the other. Same for this part as well. These are the group of genes that can be found for barcode 11, but not for barcode 10. And the other way around here, these are the genes that can be found for barcode 10 and not for barcode 11. You can see that how much they are related because they are sharing a lot of genes as well. And that's as a proof because both, both of them are coming from the same species of, of the pathogen. They, both of them are salmonella. And both also are coming from different subspecies. So that's why maybe they are not sharing some of the pathogenic genes. When you have hundreds of samples, it's easier to see what's going on using heat maps because if one of the samples is totally clean you'll find no nothing in in its genes you'll find no abundance of any pathogenic genes and then if you for example if you collected samples at different time points and you have um, in a factory you, uh, you collected samples in the morning in the afternoon in the evening and then you find that in the morning all the samples was clean and then in the afternoon the samples have like um, like one abundance of one uh of like light red and then for example, in the evening, they are in the dark red, most of them. And then you will know that the pathogen was or the, the food were infected during the time of the afternoon and and where exactly maybe some samples are collected at different processing uh, parts of the factory. And then you will identify where and when exactly the, the pathogen um, affected or or contaminated our food and then you can stop it. So instead of reading a lot of tables, a heat map can help a lot in seeing that. Also, a phylogenetic tree will help you see how the samples are related together um, somehow based on, on, on their, um, so how they are related together. So let me show you some of the phylogenetic trees that we have created for, so we create some for the AMR, the antimicrobial resistant genes, and some for the variance factor genes. So we can concatenate all the identified variance factor genes together, and we created a phylogenetic trees for all the samples together. In, in so to relate the samples together based on the variance factor genes. And also there is a different type of phylogenetic trees created in this workflow where we um, do a phylogenetic tree for every found violence factor gene so that you can see um, how each gene is found in different samples and how each gene is related to the other phylogenetically so yeah so these also are some of the nicest figures that you can see or you can do within the workflow as well so like for example here, I uh, forgot to ask you the question. So you can check the heat map and answer these questions like, like what are the, the, the violence factors that can only be found in barcode 10 and not barcode 11 and the other way around and what are the ones that are common in both of them. Just zoom in into the, um, the PDF and see exactly what's going on. For the phylogenetic tree, you can also answer the question. So make sure to pause first, and then you see the the how are the contexts, where can are the contexts found? There are some the, some genes that can only be found in some of the barcodes. In one of the barcodes, you can see how they are related together if they are found in different locations and so on. So by checking either the phylogenetic trees created for all the uh, violence factor genes together, uh, one branch for every sample, or the other type where we create a tree for every gene, either this or that, you will be able to identify the evolutionary distance between the identified 
genes or the, the ones that either for the violence factor as well as the antimicrobial resistant genes. And the other virtualizations that you do have within the same workflows are some bar, uh, bar charts that you can also um, generate using a lot of tools in Galaxy where you can have it here, for example. So the violence factor um, uh, and the AMR count table can have, a, these are the tables. You can ha also have some PDFs of the mapping, for example, coverage and so on. So I have these kinds of bar charts, but as you can see here, the quality of them is not, for example, here, it's not that good that I want to share in a paper, for example. So I can use different types of visualizations that I can also find in Galaxy. For example, here, I can, and I have tools and we have upload and we have workflows and as well as we can have also visualizations. And I can choose uh, any bar diagram or bar chart that I choose. For example, I want this one. And then I give it the table. So we have um, the host uh, percentage table, with, which includes the total number of uh, reads after quality controlling and the total number um, of hosts found um, and the percentage of these hosts or the percentage of chicken. So here I can play around and choose different types of columns. So I can name my chart. Um, uh, or hosts, reads, percentage or host reads counts. And then we have on the Y X axis, we have total number of reads, a number of reads. And you can have around here, um, Um, okay, so that was the y-axis. Okay, so the x-axis actually should be the number of samples or the samples. So you have sample one and sample two. And then on here, you have the number of reads. So if I can give it here, label, it should be number of reads. And then from here, you can choose which column to show. So I want to present the, the first column and um, I want to call the data label. Um, here is, is actually column two, which has the quality retained reads, quality retained all reads. And then we can also show a different number which can be a different row, which is, for example, the total number of chicken found. And yeah. Can also choose the different colors to present different values. Yeah, as you can see here. So here is the data values are also always found in column number one. Like the samples, you have two samples, sample one and sample two. And here is when you stop by that's barcode 11 and the, that is barcode 10. And here is the total number of reads before we do any chicken removal. And these should be the total number of chickens removed. So let me check again the values so that we can also present the values here. It should be also, yeah, what is showing here. Um, you can show here column number two. And here we show values of column number three. So here is the total number of reads um, before you remove the chicken and here is the total number of reads after you remove the chicken and so on. So you can also play around with a lot of stuff. You can also create the phylogenetic trees here by giving it the, the tree itself. Heat maps as well. You can create multiple stuff using the visualization tools here. And when you create the workflow, you can also include it in the workflow report. So 
when you go back to your user and you check your or you go back here and you check your workflows that you have run already or you're running already when the workflows finish running like for example the taxonomy profiling a, a report is automatically generated in all, any kind of workflow and and during the editing of your workflow you can even edit these types of workflows and choose which figure to present and which figure not and you can also create such figures and present it in this uh, workflows report you can also create some scripts and include them within your workflow so that they can run afterwards using any type of output data or input data from your history so you can have uh, python scripts you can have r studios you can have a lot of stuff, which you can find it in tools, for example. And then you can have um, R. You can run R Studio. Yeah, you can have a lot of stuff that you can keep running. You can just give it, um, you can make it as part of your workflow and you can run a lot of scripts afterwards. And actually for this training, um, you will find a um, GitHub repository with the same name, like pathogen detection, but the, with the full name of the workflows, which you can find was the name of pathogen fair. Um, and then you can um, GitHub. And then here, you can find in the bin Jupyter notebooks that can create for you some thick more figures if you want. So a lot of things that you can play around and include. Also here you can find Jupy tool, tool called Jupy tool, where you can just give the Jupyter notebook that you have already created, and then it will automatically take the inputs that it needs from the history and creates for you even more figures that you need. So let's get back to the training and have a full look on what exactly we have done together today. So today we have, at the beginning, we did a rerun the pre-processing workflow where we have all our samples, we did some trimming after we do a quality controlling and we did another quality controlling check after the trimming. And then we did a host filtering removal using two different ways, with mapping, with Minimap2, and with a taxonomy profiling using Calimary, the database, with the mitochondrial sequences, where we had an idea that we also found Salmonella and E. coli. So we knew a bit that there might be a bacteria that might be pathogenic here, and what might be it, like Salmonella. And then we ran three different workloads, which can also run in parallel, taking only the output from the pre-processing workflows, which are the taxonomy profiling, where we identify the microbial community using Kraken2, and we visualize it using Corona, and we said we can also use different visualization tools in Galaxy, like Finch and Pavian tool. And then we ran a gene-based pathogen identification where we created context, we polished this context, and we identified the violence factor genes to identify where are the um, the violence factors and the pathogenic genes and some information about them and all the antimicrobial resistant genes using a tool called abrogate and finally we identified our variants in our uh, sample after we do a mapping and we did the quality filtering for these variants and we calculated the mapping coverage and depth to be able to judge the SMPs and variants that we found in our reads. Finally, we take all kind of tables and we did some sample aggregations. We put all the sample together in tables and we visualize these tables using heat maps and phylogenetic trees, basically. And we did some bar charts using some of the tables that we had from the pre-processing and some of the mapping coverage and mapping depth as well. And we also have learned today that we can also have different types of other visualization using the visualization tools in, um, in Galaxy or using some other external scripts that you can also run within Galaxy, like R scripts and Jupyter scripts, Jupyter notebooks, and a lot of other visualization cool stuff. The thing that you can do for me now is don't please forget to 
um, put your feedback whenever and whenever you have a question feel free to ha have it here and whenever you want to reach us please also feel free to reach us you will find our contacts everywhere here so yeah i'm very happy to receive all your questions and thank you so much for listening and going through this training with me so see you soon in a different training and bye